welcome the next uh, panel here, the bold and the beautiful of big data. And to conduct that panel, I have Vidya Setlur from Tableau Software, who will be introducing her panel. Vidya, come on. So how are you guys this evening? Friday afternoon. Yeah, I know. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Um, so I'm Vidya Settler, and I'm really excited to moderate this panel. It's called The Bold and Beautiful of Big Data. And um, here with me, we have three great panelists. We have Jeff Yoshimura from Ayasdi, Jesper Anderson from Donna, and Noah Ilinsky from IBM. So the whole day, I guess, you were presented various aspects of you know, big data. And this panel is focused on the visual presentation aspects of big data and what that entails. So I will begin this panel by opening it up to the speakers to kind of um, allowing them to give their perspective on what beautiful big data actually means. So. Great. Thank you. So uh, at, at Ayazdi, uh, we were, were started out of a, a research project at Stanford and funded by DARPA and the National Science Foundation. And the question that the Department of Defense asked of our founders was, can you extract meaning from large complex sets of data? And then how do you present uh, that data in a way that's usable and usable by not just mathematicians or PhDs or data scientists, but usable by business people, domain experts, people that are in the labs that are trying to solve the most complex problems. So what Yazi has, has brought to the market is a, a new approach that we hope to transform the way that uh, companies and enterprises and people uh, look at data and visualize it to, to solve very complex problems. Underneath kind of the, the, the covers here is a, a vast set of, of, of machine learning uh, algorithms. Uh, we use a, a branch of mathematics called topology uh, that has been around for about 300 years. And, and what we do is, is bring forth a model-free environment where instead of starting with a question in mind or instead of starting with a query in mind, we start with the data. So we automatically let the data speak for itself. Here's just an example of, of geno genomic and clinical data. And in this case, it's, it's a million plus genes. There's thousands of, of clinical fields, thousands of patients. And the impact here is drug companies are trying to look at how do we drive a drug through clinical trials faster, or how do we um, bring a drug to market in a way that is going to, to help save lives uh, and bring out better care for people. Uh, here's another example of a different type of data set uh, that is machine and sensor data. We, we've heard a lot about uh, you know, machine data coming off of sensors. And this can be you know, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of sensor signals. It could be hundreds of thousands of, of machines. And uh, what we hear from, from, from our customers is uh, that um, efficiency gains of just 1% to 2% can be hundreds of millions of dollars in cost savings. And, and with these large sets of data, they just don't know where to start. So if you let the machine kind of bring out uh, the shape and then let the human intuition look at the patterns uh, to find the anomalies or, or unique insights, uh, that is really what uh, Ayazdi has, has built our platform for. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip through these next two slides. <laughs> Maybe. If the clicker works. If it works, yeah. Oh, there you go. And pass it to my panel colleague. <laughs> it's 10 clicks now. It must be Friday afternoon. It's, it's, it's getting tired. Oh, one more. There we oh, go. Oh, that's oh, that's there we mine. Go. Um, so the work that I've done for the last several years is uh, 
a lot of research into how do you communicate uh, effectively with data? How do you communicate what's interesting about the data to people? So uh, the work that I'm going to show here, just a couple of slides. These are not my slides, but these are, uh, I think, really good examples. This first one is from a website called hint.fm, uh, run by Fernanda Viega and Martin Wattenberg, who are um, absolute luminaries, and they have um, this, this visualization that's live, real time, of wind. It's you know delayed a few minutes, but it's a live, zoomable wind map of wind in the United States. So this is a, a screenshot I took uh, during Hurricane Sandy, uh, and you can see that there was a lot of wind uh, on the East Coast. But um, I think it's just it's an incredible, beautiful representation of, of a huge amount of data mm -hmm. um, because the you know the frequency of, of you know the intervals of the weather sensors and whatnot is, is pretty amazing. There we go. Um, this is another slide. This is uh, a population map drawn by uh, a friend of mine, a guy named Brandon Martin Anderson. He's now at the MIT Media Lab. And what he did is he took the United States Census, which is about 350 million and change um, data points, and the Mexican and the Canadian censuses, and, and plotted them all. And they're not on a map. There's not a map underneath this. This is just the dots in space. But you can see, obviously, the density uh, of where, where populations are. Um, and you can see things like boundaries of, of, of cities and, and, and other things like that. Um, so I thought that was also a pretty amazing piece of work. This is a uh, piece from the New York Times from 2010 that I really liked. So this is a time series data that's not plotted as a timeline. What this is actually showing is the correlation between uh, price of gasoline on the vertical axis, and I apologize that that's truncated a little bit there, um, and uh, miles driven on the, uh, per year per capita on the horizontal axis. And so while time is an interesting aspect of this, just showing these on a timeline would not be as interesting as showing the correlation between these two factors. And there's some labels in there that show uh, some other uh, relevant things, price of gasoline going up uh, with the Arab oil embargo in the center there and, and things like that. And those little, the little circles you see, those are the times. Those are years. So you can see the difference between, for example, um, you know, some of, the, some of the much earlier years, there's not so much change. And then when there's these major economic things going on, uh, the year-over-year -year change is very large. Um, and you can see when, when it moves, the correlations go forward and backward. And then uh, uh, just two more. This one is from this week. It was, um, uh, I thought, a really nice illustration. This is uh, showing representation of women in the House and Senate divided by party. And so the women, the, uh, the illustrator, did actual portraits of these. Um, and then the men are just represented as the suits. This is obviously a small piece of a much larger graphic. Uh, but I thought it was a really nice way to it's show the proportions cool. in a way that's much more engaging mm -hmm. than if this were uh, a simple bar graph. Mm -hmm. And finally, a simple bar graph. This is from about a year ago, February. Uh, this is a two data point chart. And I find it to be an absolutely compelling visual. That's uh, Microsoft there at almost $21 billion revenue, and the iPhone at not quite $25 billion revenue. And there's a huge amount of story behind this. They could have built graphs with market capitalization and, and how this changes over time and the highlights and lowlights. But this graph so succinctly so powerfully conveys a really amazing story about the iPhone, a product that at this point in time, when this graph was made, was a five-year-old product, did not exist five years before. And this is how far it had come, larger, just the iPhone by itself, larger than all Microsoft. So I found that to be a really compelling, really clear, very simple graph that they took everything else out of just to tell this one very powerful story. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, please. So the work that I've done and been involved in has really been focused on how you think of data visualization as a pop cultural element and how do you engage with consumers um, with that. And so at Market Bloom, we really focused on how do you make that a data interface and how do you give this, make this a playful tool for users to explore their data. And when Tui made some iPad visualizations, the first one that we made is this called Planetary, where it's a galactic view upon your music database. So we exploited the fact that the music library on an iPad is a hierarchical view, and then we just extrapolated that to galaxy, solar system, uh, uh, and then planetary moons around the planet's um, view to the songs. And kind of you can view the hierarchy and can move and dance around it. And it's really just about a different way of viewing that hierarchy that's more engaging and a little more playful, a little more expressive. Um, and so we, we took that again and we built something that was a little more dynamic. This is a tool called Biologic. And Biologic was really about showing the, the messiness of your social stream data. And so what we do is we, we were getting caught up as entrepreneurs. We were too busy to keep up with our Twitter feeds and things like that. And we wanted a tool that would cross cut it and just give us a timeline or, or a, a flat view of what happened for the day. And so that's what this is. On the, um, the left side, you'll see we, we represent everyone as a cell. And the size of the, the cell is basically based around how popular they were that day and how engaging they were that day. And each one of the organelles within the cell is a, a tweet um, labeled by how important it is and, and how engaging it is. And then you can actually go through and click the tweets and you can slide 
Um, and it sort of gives you a sloppy, fun way of viewing a data set that you know, is sort of static and is boring and is very regimented into a timeline view right now, and we wanted to just see what happened if you moved away from that. Um, a little more big data, we also did a project where we hacked through, um, prior to Instagram having an API, we, we hacked through their, their servers and created a map of all of the Instagram photos prior to March 2011 and weighted them by what was interesting. And so this is a snapshot of the photos as users weighted them interesting at the coast of San Francisco. And you can see that the experience around all of the bay is really about the Golden Gate Bridge. No matter where you're taking a picture, if you can see the Golden Bridge, that is the one people engage with most. And this is, you know, all these tools are sort of interactive and they're a little bit better if you go to our, our site and check them out and play with them. Um, the snapshots don't quite do them justice. But you know, these are the sort of things we played with at Bloom. Uh, now I'm the CTO of a company called Donna, where the goal is to help place users in the context of the data that they throw off themselves, as well as the data that the ambient data around them, and, to, and building personal agents to assist people in engaging with that data. And so this, we've changed from, or I've changed from viewing the uh, data visualization as the principal interface to the data visualization being key components within the experience to convey this data. And so unfortunately, we're in limited beta. I can't show you the full app, but these are widgets that we have within the app. And you can see that on the left, again, we have some views that really integrate why your trans, uh, transit time is slow, you know, incidents and what the alternative routes are. And we do things where we skew. So the axis here is um, time distance and not just distance, because it, that's actually more cognitively resonant to users. And so we've taken some really kind of intense data viz tricks to make a simple widget a much more engaging view for our users. And then the second one is just kind of the data visualization is actually really intense, and we use a lot of old school data visualization elements all the time, like a calendar, which is really a visualization of time that's structured in a much more engaging way. And so we just took that in this case and played with it a little bit. But it, you know, you're used to and you're familiar with data visualization from centuries ago. Uh, and then I showed you a bunch of pretty high intensity, you know, and glossy graphics. This is actually, as a CTO, I have a huge server farm I'm responsible for, and I use really primitive, lame graphics. This is from something called Graphite. Graphite was state of the art in 2004, and this is what I look at. Right? It, it doesn't have to be this fancy, glossy thing. Sometimes a timeline is what you need, and sometimes whatever can render it conveniently for you is the tool you want. Cool. So I, you know, so e each of the speakers have kind of given various examples of how big data could be visualized. And one of the common questions that I hear a lot is, okay, you know, a lot of these visualizations are beautiful and they look attractive, but how do you actually determine their usefulness? So, Noah? Well, so for me, I have a bias because I came into visualization through user experience work. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the bias that I bring to all these things is, how does this serve my customer? How does this serve the person who I'm doing the work for? Mm -hmm. So for me, the bottom line um, for, for uh, beauty is how functional is it? Mm -hmm. and, and aesthetics is a, is a facet of that because aesthetics makes, them, uh, makes the visualization more engaging, more appealing. But uh, if you have a visualization that's just beautiful but has no function or is very hard to use, there's no real value there. Um, you can have a cake that's frosted beautifully, but if the cake inside's no good, you don't care. Right. Um, so, so the functionality fundamentally has to be there. That's, a, that's a, an aspect of design that doesn't get talked about enough, but it's a key aspect of design is the function. How does it work? Mm -hmm. uh, and then once that's established, you can then um, do the appropriate uh, visual and aesthetic treatment to make it uh, engaging and that sort of thing. But the, the bones have to be there first. Okay. Any other aspects beyond... I would say I mean, this is something that actually you know, data visualizers will get you know, over beers, get really hot and bothered about, and there's a lot of controversy. Yeah. Um, and I think the, the important part really is to let you remember your audience, remember the purpose, right? Sometimes I think a, a flashy kind of uh, shallow thing, if you just want to grab attention, if that's a goal of the visualization, you just want to call attention to something, that can work out. Um, but if you're building a tool, if you're building something where the, the, the goal is to get people to drill into the data and experience it themselves, then the substance starts to take over and you have to have different constraints. And so, you know, there is the infographic on the one side, which is sort of this very flat, static, just illustration-driven thing, and then there's like really technical, rich uh, tools, and then the spectrum between is where you play with, just depending upon what your goal is and what you want to get out of the visualization. And I think if you just take data in its raw form, it's ugly. Right? It's not beautiful, it's rows and columns. 
Uh, what makes data beautiful is the ability to extract knowledge out of it. So if an end user can extract knowledge out of it and do something that is, is meaningful, that's going, going to solve something, uh, you know, cure a disease, uh, drive a breakthrough in some sort of innovation, that, that is, is, I think, what is, is beautiful about data. It's that knowledge creation that comes out of this uh, through, through the variety of means of, of tools and charts and, and, and underlying technology underneath the, the, the data that's powering it. Mm -hmm. So kind of moving on from that, um, you know, I work at Tableau and I, I do see a lot of uh, visualizations that are created using our software and posted on Tableau Public. Um, if, you've, if you're familiar with that, it's just the online version where um, people can see other people's visualizations, collaborate, um, modify, and add comments. And while the software um, puts a great deal of effort in trying to provide good defaults for users to create aesthetic visualizations, and it, you know, users will spend a lot of time and a lot of effort to make things that are not at all compelling or beautiful or useful. And it always leaves us perplexed. It's like, you know, how do they actually probe into and modify the, the default color palette and choose, you know, bright red and bright green right next to each other uh, as continuous bars? So the question is, what do you see as some of the common mistakes that people do when they're creating visualizations, especially with tools that are out there? Um, and what, what are, are, do you have any tips or ways of helping these users to kind of mitigate some of these common mistakes? Uh, yes. I, I think these days, I, it might be a product of, of where I sit in, in the community, but I just people trying too hard and kind of, you know, whipping out D3 and like, really, really bespoke, very custom, very interactive visualizations where Tableau would be fine, right? Yeah. Like, don't reinvent the, te the, the bar graph. It's right. great, it works. Right. Uh, and so basically doing too much work beforehand um, to get things done. Uh, but that's a little bit about, you know, where I'm, I sit and like, we make, we're involved in the community like this visualization as a product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what? Go ahead. Or, I think, it, Visualizations that are created for their own sake, uh, I think, think that that's just uh, kind of a fundamentally flawed process. So just, just take an infographic. We all love infographics. They're beautiful. They, they, they give us some eye-popping pop uh, insights into something. But are they useful? Are they actually being used to do something? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I think you have to put it in the frame of, of how can you make these visualizations something that is going to be useful yeah, and, and I totally agree with that. And I think um, related to that, there's a lot of stuff that gets created uh, without enough thought ahead of time of what is the function? What are we trying to learn from this particular visualization that we're creating? So, um, and it's fine if you're not sure what's in your data and you just need to explore it and, and, and kind of get a look at what's there. But when you're going to share something, there ought to be a goal for each deliverable. You ought to know what it's there for. And if you don't have that goal, it's very hard to hit the target, right? Um, very closely related to that, I think I see a lot of visualizations where there's too much data or too many labels or there's just too much visual noise going on because it isn't focused. And so there's nothing to, uh, there's not a logic with which you can use to exclude that part of the data set that isn't relevant to this point that we're making. So uh, a couple of the examples that I had up on the screen earlier, I picked very, very much because they were very clean. They're very simple, um, very pared down. There's not a lot of visual noise there uh, because that doesn't serve the purpose that they had, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and so I would say in addition to uh, losing sight of, of the focus or not having a focus, um, a side effect of that is trying to put too much in when uh, a simpler graphic or separate graphics that show separate but related things very clearly rather than trying to, trying to layer them on top of each other and sort of obfuscating each other. Mm -hmm. I see that often. Cool. So, I mean, we talk about, you know, you, ha you have your data and you, you'd want to kind of make sense of it, discover knowledge, um, perhaps um, analyze some of this data in more human-readable form in the form of visualizations. And the question I have is, Beyond kind of the common functionality of analytics, what other roles can big data visualization play? I mean, I think the, the most important role that visualizations can play is 
it can be a guide, they can be a compass, they can be a map, they can, they can help uh, a data scientist, a domain expert, a business person, an analyst, uh, solve things that they wouldn't have been able to solve uh, without visualization. So let the data be that guide that, that really allows for, for breakthroughs to happen. I think also that, that uh, data visualization can be used to sort of surface the emotional content or, of, uh, of data. Like you're talking about like, data itself is ugly, and it, it really is. And like, um, but there's usually a story, there's usually a compelling phenomenon through there that is actually resonant to the viewer in some way, and that the best way to get at that is to you know, carefully design a visualization that really is subtle and engages with your audience in the correct way to draw those emotions out. Yeah, uh, obviously visualization is excellent, excellent for analysis and for you know, seeing gaps, seeing outliers. Right. Um, I love it for communication, right? I, like, that's why maps exist, right? Um, that's why these infographics exist is because those, those visual formats are so compelling and so engaging to us and it can be a very, um, a very effective and a very powerful means of not just conveying knowledge, but um, like there's been studies that show that people are more strongly persuaded by uh, evidence that is in opposition to their own beliefs if it's presented visually rather than if it's just spoken or if it's just in text. Yes. Um, it's harder to argue with a graph that says this is the big bar and this is the little bar, right? Yes. Like, and, and that assumes that the graph is done and, and you know, hasn't been distorted and that sort of thing. But um, it's, uh, it's just such a powerful tool for communication. The, the optic nerve is uh, the biggest pipeline into the brain. It's about nine megabits. It's about the, the speed of slow Wi-Fi. Right. Um, it's the fastest way to get data into your brain. And, and we have so much uh, capability built into our eyes and our brains for perceiving shape and size and placement and all that, that being able to leverage that, you can convey uh, knowledge in a, in a very quick and very compelling way. And that, that sometimes is very hard to do with text or with digits. So I, I love it as a communication medium. Yeah, I mean, one thing at Tableau is we're also focusing, I mean, analytics is a big thing, but storytelling and mm -hmm. um, coming up with features in our product that would help people convey stories, um, whether it's you know a journalist, whether it's just someone who wants to make a compelling uh, piece known to to the world through some some perspective of the data that people would be like, oh, really? Um, so, and I think also uh, one of the other things is now a lot of the visualizations, particularly on the web, are interactive. And you know, you were talking about oh, you know, the static the static views don't really, uh, I mean, are not compelling enough to kind of show their true worth. But you know, being able to interact and click on stuff and allowing the user to explore um, seems like it adds other dimensions to kind of the, the data itself for, um, for a user to understand. Well, yeah, and that, that reveal becomes sort of part of the narrative yes. element, right? Of like, right. look at all this, more, this whole new part of the story we have to tell you when you click through. It can be really quite, quite compelling. Right. Um, so, you know, talking about interaction, uh, one of the things that I've been seeing is there's you know all these devices and computers that um, are are these devices to view these visualizations are becoming more mobile, right? I mean, people use their tablets to um, view charts or show people presentations on the go. So, what is your take on you know how these big data visualizations would uh, take form with mobility uh, being kind of playing a bigger role in this whole centerpiece. Do you have any? Uh, it, that was, so that was definitely something we explored at Bloom. Yeah. Uh, we definitely view uh, visualizations be, uh, as tactile experiences, and we mm -hmm. think that they're, they're naturally geared. They're these giant touch points, and you can really kind of move around and manipulate it, and it becomes much more visceral that way. Um, but it does require that you edit much more and you construct the visualization much more carefully because you know, our fingers are only so, so small and you have to really limit what you show and what you can engage with. But moving through data that way and kind of engaging with it and manipulating and, you know, you're almost building queries dynamically if you do right. it right, right. Uh, can be really quite compelling and quite efficient. I think it's not just an entertaining pop cultural thing that we played with, but I think it's a, going to become a, a really engaging way of drilling through data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I just put together a, an example. Uh, Think about personal healthcare and, and where uh, healthcare is going. Uh, mobile devices, tablets, you, know, you have people that have mobile devices and tablets, you're gonna have doctors that have these, these tablets that, that are in offices. So if, 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 if you go in and get your tumors read, 
and you can immediately have that data read on some sort of mobile device like a tablet mm -hmm. in real time. And let's say that you're a breast cancer, um, uh, you're a breast cancer patient and you can have your tumor read specifically on a network that shows where across this network um, you um, lie based on, say, similarity uh, across other breast cancer patients. That's pretty powerful because then the doctor can pre prescribe the right type of treatment uh, to guide you know, your, uh, your outcome, which is hopefully that you're either gonna survive or you're gonna live longer. So I think visualization and mobility have a huge role in, in our daily lives and, and what we do as people every single day. From a design perspective, it presents some really interesting uh, interface considerations. So uh, as you said, there's, uh, you know, on a small device, your targets, you, you have to, you have to uh, make targets that are finger size. And so even if you've got a 1,000 or 2,000 pixel wide screen, if it's only a few inches, it's still very small. And so um, the interface design that you wrap around that uh, would be like, like, so Tableau is great on the big screen, but it's, right. it, it wouldn't be a viable product on a three or a five inch screen. There's yes. just, there's too much going on. So you have to reconsider what is the interaction model. Uh, moving from mouse to touch obviously is different when you, you know, selecting all these things. So um, uh, to go back to my earlier point, uh, when you're designing for the small screen or designing for mobile, um, really getting clear on what is the focus, what is the purpose of this particular interface that we're putting in front of somebody, what is the, what is the specific goal of this visualization that we're building for them to consume on the small screen uh, in a way that it, that it is a, a, appropriate to the screen size, it's appropriate to the bandwidth, it's appropriate to the finger touch size, um, uh, you know, refresh rates, whatever that is. Um, it's, uh, and I think that's, a, that's a, um, maybe even a trickier case than doing something like designing for the web, where the web is nice and all, but it's mostly static content. You can reload a page, maybe you can drag things around, but you know, text on a page is not as interesting a design challenge as something visual and interactive when you try to shrink it down to a tenth or a hundredth the size that it was originally designed for. I mean, it also opens up new challenges and questions about um, you know, consumption versus creation, right? Yeah. Where how much, you know, if you're, if you're viewing stuff on your iPad um, and if, if you want to contribute to the visualization, maybe add annotations or add some other data or, you know, live data that's coming from the device itself, um, how would one go about that? Um, so I think it raises some interesting questions and directions for how visualization would take form. Cool, so um, kind of we're, we're at the two and a half minute mark and I wanted to ask one more question since this is an entrepreneurial conference. Um, for businesses looking at building, um, you know, companies looking at building business enterprise around big data visualization, what are some of the key value propositions that you see for these companies? Better tools. Better tools. I mean, there's there's been a huge uh, upswelling of companies that are you know visualization front ends for Hadoop or um, uh, you know drag and drop visualization tools, and uh, there's some good starts out there. But there's um, well, I think the more tools you have, the more accessible visualization technology becomes to everybody, and I think that's fantastic. And I've really right. enjoyed seeing all the companies pop up and, and what people are doing with them. And I think there's still room for more tools to um, sort of bridge the gap between you know, the real drag and drop desktop level and the code level. Yeah. And uh, there's room in between to sort of abstract that. And there's a few companies that are going that way, but that's, that's really an open problem yet. And I think there's a really uh, rich opportunity there mm -hmm. um, to bring some of the, the fine detail control of, of code level with some of the ease of use and, and rapid development that you get with the drag and drop tools. So I think there's, uh, for me at least, that'd be the most exciting thing for me to see. Because um, mm -hmm. I, th I feel like we've got more or less the big data back end under control. And we understand fundamentally what the best practices are, though they're not evenly distributed yet. Right. Um, but uh, better tools that can help kind of bridge that, right? That can bring the best practices that can connect to the big data and do that in a way that is as accessible and as flexible as both ends of the spectrum. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would echo that in a full stack approach as well. Like, it, it really, like, I see too many visualization tools right now that are just a sort of veneer on top of Hadoop queries or something like that, and you have to, like, these things should be integrated and the query should be structured so they're fast because visualization is an interactive experience and needs to be immediate. And so you have to have designed your column store correctly beforehand in order to get that right. And no one's really even holding your hand through that process, let alone building the tool that makes that clean and simple for people. And that's something, that's a space I would like to see filled quickly. 
I think the biggest uh, value add is, is time to insight and time to discovery. And can you take all this massive, complex data, visualize it, and find a way to find things that you didn't know that even existed in that data? Mm -hmm. And can you use that, 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 those insights and discoveries to drive breakthroughs and drive innovation for, for your organization? Cool. So, um, so I, I hope you guys got um, some perspective into you know what big data visualization entails, some of the problems, what are some of the future directions for it, and challenges, and um, you know promises and opportunities. So um, I'd like to thank the speakers for um, this panel and for their thoughts and discussions. So, and thanks to the audience for being here um, Friday evening and participating as well. So thanks a lot, and feel free to meet with us um, after the panel if you'd like to talk more. We'll be here. Thank you.